Hello, my name's Jackie Fletcher and I'm an independent nurse consultant. I've got a specialist interest in pressure area care, wound care and tissue viability in general. In this video, we're going to talk about caring for patients who are confined to bed and how that may increase their risk of pressure ulcers occurring. In the NHS in England, we tend to use the asking bundle, which is a bundle of care which talks about all the different elements we bring together to prevent pressure ulcers. And each of those elements is important, and generally speaking, we have to do all of them. But for the purpose of this video, we're going to be focusing on immobility, the eye in the asking bundle, and how that can cause damage to the patient's skin. We're also going to demonstrate how simple repositioning techniques in the bed can help prevent pressure ulcers forming, Think about what the patient themselves they can do, either in terms of repositioning themselves, but also maintaining their muscle function by doing simple exercises, either independently or supported by clinicians and carers. And we'll look at the role that electronic bed frames play in that prevention. In the interest of transparency, I need to declare that this is paid for consultancy work and represents my personal views, not that of the National Wound Care Strategy or NHS England or Improvement. Immobility is the main cause of pressure damage because the patient's weight is not moved from an area of high loading and that can lead to compression of the blood vessels. When you compress the blood vessels, you reduce oxygen and nutrient flow, ultimately leading to tissue death. We need to focus on where those high points of pressure ulcers can be, typically over the bony prominences as we're demonstrating here. So we're going to do a demonstration where we've highlighted those bony prominences for you, as you can see here using these red dots. And these show that along the spine, at the sacrum and coccyx, on the patient's hip over the greater trochanter, at the elbows, and the shoulder, between the knees, and at the heels, are those large bony areas that we need to consider. If we're going to think about pressure ulcer prevention, we need to think about the mechanical loads. So particularly about how pressure, shear and friction affect the skin and how those three things come together to form tissue deformation. Friction is not included in the international guidelines definition of a pressure ulcer. It talks primarily about pressure and shear, but we need to consider friction because it's friction that makes the shear forces worse, which cause internal tissue deformation. And that's what ultimately leads to pressure ulceration. Because friction and shear can be quite difficult concepts to explain or for somebody to visualise, I'm going to do a demonstration using this cake to explain to you what might be going on that you can't actually see. So what we have is a cake that has two hard surfaces, one to represent the skin and one to represent a bony prominence. And in between those is a much softer set of tissues and that can be the subcutaneous fat and the muscle but also the blood vessels as you can see from the jam. So we're going to do two experiments, one showing you what happens when you have a smooth skin or the patient's wearing a fabric that helps them slide down the bed. And that's represented by this smoother surface here. And we're going to do a second experiment that shows you how much difference it makes and how you increase the magnitude of friction and shear if the patient has a, a moist, clammy skin and perhaps is a little edematous and therefore they stick much more to the, to the bed sheet. So in this first view, what we're going to see is that it's quite easy to move the cake. So if we just apply direct pressure from above, firstly, you can see all the internal things start to move. Not only are they compressed, but they're changing shape. This is deformation. If we apply that sideways pressure, the shear, and push from the side, what you can see is first of all, the cake starts to move. So it reduces that pressure a little bit, but with a little bit of additional pressure, you also get that squashing of the internal contents of the cake. So you've got a little bit of resistance, a little bit of friction force, you've got the slide from the friction, but you've also got the pressure which causes the shear and the deformation in conjunction with the friction. So I'm now going to flip the cake over and show what happens when you've got a surface with a higher friction coefficient, representing perhaps that moist clammy skin and how that increases the deformation of the tissues. So remember the surface next to the table is the skin and we've now got the sticky surface representing the clammy skin. If we just apply direct pressure, there's really no change. What you see is the internal tissues are compressed and that they change in shape. The change comes when we're looking at the patient starting to slide down the bed and how this impacts on friction or shear. 
Do you remember with the smooth surface when I started to put a push from the side, the cake moved very easily. But as I start to push now, it's very difficult for me to actually move. And what's moving is what would be the bone. Mm -hmm. And what we're seeing is that compression and all this internal tissue is being squeezed sideways and there's a great change in shape happening. There's a huge amount of deformation and a huge amount of shear simply because you've changed the friction at the surface, which slows down the movement of the patient. Although we're going to focus today on the external and the mechanical loads, it's important to remember that there are certain factors that make the patient themselves more at risk. That might be older age or diabetes. These affect their skin condition and their skin tone, and also their internal response to the applied mechanical load like pressure. When we think about immobility and its impact on pressure ulcers, we mustn't forget that it has other impacts on the patient in general. There's good evidence that shows when a patient is hospitalised in bed, they lose muscle mass, and that can be as much as 10% muscle mass. But also, more importantly, when we're considering moving the patient or repositioning the patient, you will know yourself that if you sit in one position for a long time, you can get quite stiff. And the same is true for patients. If we don't reposition them or even do small movements frequently, they can get quite stiff and that can be painful. So when we come to do a proper reposition, you might find that they've got increased levels of pain and discomfort. And we need to be sure that we manage that appropriately before we consider movement. The asking bundle tells us it's important to assess the risk of pressure ulcers and to be vigilant, inspecting the skin and caring for it. The individual elements of the asking bundle are the A for assessment of risk, the S for the skin care. Skin assessment and skin care are really important. The second S represents the surface on which we put the patient, the K for keeping the patient moving, and the I, which we typically think about incontinence, but is also for any form of increased moisture on the skin, so that could also be sweat or wound exudate. The N is for maintaining good nutrition and hydration, and the G is for the giving of information. That's about giving information to your clinical colleagues so that we transfer information across, but also about giving information to the patient so that they can participate in their own care. This video, however, is focused on immobility, the K, the keep moving factor of the asking bundle. So when we look at the asking bundle, the K is what represents managing mobility because it's about keeping the person moving. And we need to be thinking about why we're keeping them moving and that's to redistribute the pressure from those at-risk areas. So we need to think about moving it from those at-risk areas to less vulnerable sites. We can also think about maximising the patient's ability to do this, as I mentioned, by increasing activity and encouraging exercises. So although we traditionally think of a major reposition, moving the patient onto the side or into a 30 degree tilt, simple moves like getting the patient to lean forward in a chair, encouraging them to do this by placing things so they have to reach for them, can help to offload the tissues even for very short periods. So when we're thinking about keeping the patient moving, remember it's not just about repositioning, it's also about maximising the patient's activity and encouraging exercises. When we're repositioning patients, whether they're in the bed or chair, we need to think about what it is we're doing and what we're trying to achieve. So what we're aiming to do is get the patient off their bony prominences. The most common way we do this is using a technique in bed called the 30 degree tilt. And this supports the patient's weight over the large muscle areas rather than on the bony prominences. We're now going to demonstrate how to put the patient into the 30 degree tilt. So firstly, ensure that your patient is ready for the manoeuvre. Check that they're not in pain. Make sure that they're comfortable and that they understand what it is you're going to do to them. Secondly, check that you're ready for the manoeuvre. Make sure that the bed is at the correct height for you to carry out the manoeuvre safely. Make sure you have all the equipment you will need to hand, including the pillows and if you need it, a slide sheet. Usually we would use two people to do this manoeuvre for your own safety. But for the purpose of the demonstration, so that you can see the red dots, in this instance, we're only going to use one person. Ensure that the bed is as flat as possible. The first part of the move is to start the roll onto the patient's right side. So you will take the left arm and move it across the abdomen. You're then going to move the left leg, crossing it over the right one. This will help you to roll the patient onto their side and use the pillow to support her. The pillow goes behind the pelvis and is tucked into the back. 
It's important to ensure that the patient is safe. So if there is only one person, you would make sure you have the cot sides up so the patient doesn't fall out of the bed. They may also help you to pull themselves into this side lying position. Once you have the pillows in place, allow the patient to fall gently back into position. At this point, you may need to use a second pillow tucked under the head pillow that's supporting the shoulder so that the patient feels comfortable and well supported. Use the third pillow to go between the legs to support the knees and the ankles to prevent them being held together and causing high points of pressure. Ensure that you use the pillow lengthwise that you support the whole length of the leg as this is much more comfortable for the patient and reduces the pressure along the leg. Before leaving the patient, ensure that they feel comfortable and well supported so that they are more likely to remain in the position. Now that the patient is in the 30 degree tilt position, you can see that you have got their weight supported over a large muscle mass, primarily over their buttocks, and that you're able to see those bony prominences are not in contact with the surface. So you can see the red dots on the right hip is clear of the bed, at the knee, and the pillow is supporting the knees from touching each other and also the ankle bones. It also elevates the heel from the bed, reducing the pressure there. You can encourage the patient themselves to reposition. When doing this, you need to ensure that they have the appropriate equipment to support them to do it safely so they're not causing damage to the skin and that they do lift themselves clear and don't cause friction and shear. So you might consider using a bed pole or if the bed has them fitted and sides are appropriate, they can use those to pull themselves over and turn onto their side for a period. Remember, patients shouldn't stay too long in any one position and any form of seated or semi-recumbent position increases the risk over the sacrum coccyx ischial tuberosities. When we're thinking about repositioning patients and how we move and handle patients, we traditionally think about moving and handling equipment. But don't forget that beds can be used to help change the patient's position and more importantly, support them in a stable position. Most profiling bed frames have a handset so that the patient can sit themselves up. Remember, we're trying to keep the bed rest below 30 degrees head of elevation. And some bed frames actually have a pause when the bed frame reaches 30 degrees so the patient knows when to stop. When putting the back rest up, it's important to protect the heels, either by lifting them clear of the surface or using a slide sheet, because as you put the back rest up, the heels may travel along the surface, causing increased friction and shear. When you're putting the patient in the seated position, bringing the back rest up, you should also put the knee brake up as well. This movement behind the knees helps stop the patient sliding down the bed by gravity. Unfortunately, with some beds, what happens is as you bring the knees up towards the main part of the body, you get some compression of the abdomen. And this tightness around the abdomen can push the lungs up and can make them feel that they can't breathe very well or generally feel quite uncomfortable. So you'll find the patient tries to shuffle their bottom forward a little bit until they feel more comfortable. Some beds allow you to move the backrest and the knee break in one single action. Where this is present, it should be the default because it's much safer. And you do this with the press of just a single button. A bed with an elliptical backrest has a platform that slides back, giving more space and supporting the natural extension of the patient's spine. As the backrest elevates, it adjusts at the base also, moving back to accommodate the natural curve of the spine and avoid squeezing the abdomen. Some beds also have an auto contour function to prevent patients slipping down in the bed. This basically bends at the back of the knees. When we're thinking about immobility, it's not a distinct thing, because in itself, immobility can be different for different individuals. So think about the length of time a patient's immobile. Some patients are permanently immobile, for example, if they've had a spinal cord injury. Others are fully immobile for short periods. So if we immobilise them by anaesthetising them whilst they're in theatre, that's a very distinct thing in itself and the protection they need in that time is very different. It may also be quite sporadic. So we have patients who have things like ME or long COVID who take themselves to bed because they feel very weak and very lethargic. But in between times, they're quite mobile and feeling well in themselves. 
Equally, we can have patients who have generally well health, but might be quite elderly and quite frail, but can very quickly become immobile if they develop things like a urinary tract infection or a chest infection, and that really debilitates them for that period of time. So, as we've identified, the opposite of immobility is to keep the patient moving. And where possible, what we want to do is to return the patient to independence, or as far as we can along that continuum, depending what their health condition might be. And in doing so, we not only prevent pressure ulcers, but we prevent loss of muscle mass, we maintain tone and prevent stiffness and pain for the patient. So there are benefits all round. So as the patient gets better and starts to return to normality, we need to start thinking about how we can support their independent movement, but also making sure we maintain safety. The flip side of improving mobility can sometimes be increasing the risk of falls, so we need to keep that safe environment in place. We also need to consider as the patient starts to move again, we've discussed the fact that there may be pain and stiffness. So the return to mobility may be slow and you may need to take small steps at first and manage the patient's pain and encourage some joint mobility as you go along. The longer you leave it, actively or passively, there is more chance of pain from joint stiffness. So in summary, in this video, we've thought about how we might optimise the management of patients to prevent pressure ulcers whilst they're in bed. We've looked at the factors that might contribute to risk of developing pressure ulcers, particularly the mechanical forces. We've also looked at good moving and handling techniques and reminded ourselves of where the bony prominences are and how important it is to consider those when you're thinking about repositioning and in terms of offloading them. In summary, remember you can use the asking bundle to keep the skin and joints and muscles as healthy as possible and where possible return the patient to their previous level of independence or as close as you can get. Remembering that you can use the bed and the equipment to help you to get the patient comfortable, to reposition them and to reduce the risk of pressure ulcers.